Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for coming to this launch event on the legitimacy of multi-stakeholderism in internet governance spaces. My name is Nadia Czechia, and I'm a PhD fellow at the United Nations University, Chris, and the Free University of Brussels. Uh, and today, I am pleased uh, to invite you to explore three publications that look at the legitimacy of multi-stakeholderism. So today, we'll have a presentation online from Dr. Hortense Junge, uh, from uh, the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam. Um, then it will be followed by uh, Dr. Kryn Kath, who sent in a presentation um, and um, speaking about loud men talking loudly, exclusionary cultures of internet governance. This will be followed with the launch of my publication on youth participation in internet governance. And followed by these three publications, there is the AUDA's Internet Governance Roadmap, Improving Multi-Stakeholderism for Tomorrow to provide us a perspective for the future. After this, we will invite you to come to the microphones and share your reflections and your ideas, but we would like to also question three questions. How can multi-stakeholder initiatives promote meaningful participation from diverse stakeholders and social groups? Um, the second question, what is the relationship between inclusive participation and the legitimacy of multi-stakeholder initiatives? And the last question, what lessons for other multi-stakeholder bodies can we draw from the different ways in which the three multi-stakeholder bodies at the focus of this session? So in this case, ICANN, ITF, and IGF, and aim to promote participation. To help us uh, in these reflections and these discussions, we invited two discussants. So I would like to thank you very much uh, to uh, Alisa Hever from the Dutch government and uh, Elisa Lindeberg from the Norwegian Communications Authority for joining us here today. So I would like to invite my co-moderator, Dr. Hortense Jonge, who's joining us online to start the first presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, let me just try to set this up. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay great. Thank you so much. Um, the presentation that I'll be giving today, it is, uh, it is part of a, it was part of a larger research project that I worked on together with uh, Professor Jana Schulte on uh, legitimacy in ICANN, specifically the levels, the drivers and the implications um, of legitimacy. I can only give a, a snapshot of some of the findings today and some of the key publications, but I, on each of the slides, I listed the key publications that give a lot more detailed inf information about each of these findings. But um, the publications, they all stem from one research project, uh, which asked the question, how far and on what grounds does, mul oops, apologies, does multi-stakeholderism as a mode of global governing gain legitimacy? And specifically in this project, we measure the, we measure the levels of legitimacy beliefs toward key multi-stakeholder apparatus I can, and to try to identify what generates or what limits those legitimacy beliefs. And we studied this by means of a couple of hundreds of interviews with members of the board, with members of staff, the community, um, as well as also with several outsiders to ICANN. And we conducted this project between uh, 2018 and 2019. So I think also in the, in the next presentations, legitimacy it is interpreted in many different studies in vastly different ways. And in this study, we understand it as the belief and the perception that a governing body has the right to rule and also exercises that right appropriately. So concretely, we are interested in the opinion that ICANN has the right to formulate and administer certain rules for the global internet. So we understand legitimacy as underlying confidence in and approval of a governance arrangement, which encompasses a lot more than just passing support for a particular measure um, and instead entails deeper faith in the governance apparatus as such. And why do we focus on legitimacy? Well, both the literature as well as many people that we interviewed, they indicate that legitimacy can help a governor. So in this case, I can to acquire mandates, obtain resources, attract participation, take decisions, and vice versa if 
a governor does not have legitimacy or lower their lower legitimacy beliefs, it more by, might be more difficult to acquire mandates or obtain resources, for example. So one of the first publications in this project, we sought to identify the levels and the patterns of legitimacy beliefs towards ICANN. On this slide, I'm summarizing the key four findings. Um, I will pay most um, attention to this, and then I, can, uh, I will be spending a little bit less time on different explanations for this. But when it comes to the different levels of legitimacy beliefs towards ICANN, we find that taking all audiences together, average levels of legitimacy beliefs are towards ICANN are neither so high as to warrant complacency, nor so low as to prompt alarm. So we, see, we also find that these legitimacy beliefs towards ICANN generally correlate with closeness to the ICANN regime. So it's fairly secure legitimacy on the inside, amongst the board, the staff, the community, and then it gets somewhat more wobbly the further we get we get removed from the ICANN core. Several exceptions aside, legitimacy beliefs within the ICANN sphere, so board community staff show limited variation by stakeholder group, by geographical region, or by social category. And we also find that there's no glaring Achilles heel of vulnerability in any quarter, but also no striking concentration of greater ICANN champions, with the exception perhaps of staff and board who have notably stronger legitimacy beliefs. Then a key question, of course, is how can we explain these legitimacy beliefs and how can we understand why um, some people have more confidence in ICANN than, than others. So in a series of publications, we are trying to find out what are the sources, the drivers or the causes of legitimacy beliefs. So what conditions can be fostered or attacked in order to bolster or undermine legitimacy beliefs. And we focus specifically on three types of explanation. Organizational drivers, so institutional drivers that have to do with ICANN as an organization, the way it works, its procedures, its purpose, its purpose, its performance. Individual drivers that lie with the people who actually ascribe or do not ascribe legitimacy or confidence or have confidence in ICANN. And societal drivers that have to do with broader societal structures. I'll very quickly go over some of the key findings, but here on the bottom of the, of the slides, you can also see some of the publications that discuss this a lot more extensively. But we do find that actually a large number of institutional sources are positively associated with uh, legitimacy beliefs toward ICANN. Think, for example, of accountability, fair, uh, fair decision-taking procedures, timely decision-taking, um, and several aspects related to the purpose or the mission that ICANN stands for. We also find that several individual level drivers of ICANN are positively associated with legitimacy in ICANN. So it matters whether member, a participant or perceiver, so to say, someone who ascribes or does not ascribe legitimacy is a member of the ICANN board and staff, who notably have higher, on average, have higher confidence in ICANN. Uh, than members from the ICANN community. And people who, have feel, who feel that they have benefited personally from ICANN and its policies also to end, tend to accord uh, or more likely to accord legitimacy to ICANN. And finally, we looked at several societal level drivers or explanations of legitimacy in ICANN. And what I'm focusing on here specifically is perceptions of structural inequalities, for example, based on age, ethnicity, race, gender, geopolitics, language. And to sum up, actually a very extensive discussion, um, but um, we found that a lot of participants perceive structural inequalities in ICANN, do find them problematic, but that most of them do not undermine their confidence in ICANN with the, with the exception perhaps of inequalities, uh, problematic inequalities um, uh, uh, based on the geopolitics, so between the global north and the global south. So to summarize, Legitimacy understood as approval of ICANN as a governance mechanism for the global internet um, is, inter is important. Uh, we find that ICANN has fairly secure legitimacy amongst its insiders, then it starts to wane off a little bit gradually the further we get removed. Um, and we find multiple and variable drivers of these levels of like, ICANN legitimacy beliefs. So there's not a simple formula available to solve all legitimacy challenges. 
And we also believe that knowing what levels of legitimacy beliefs prevail in what quarters uh, and what kinds of force, forces shape those legitimacy beliefs can nevertheless contribute to more informed and nuanced policy making. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hortensa, for your presentation. Um, then I will share my screen and uh, we'll show the presentation of Dr. Kareen Kath, who is unfortunately not able to be here today. Um, and you should be able to see it now. I think we can't hear her. So the sound is not connected. Am I screen sharing? Yes. So do you know why the sound is not working for the presentation? So while I wait to figure out what is happening with this, uh, I propose I'll just go straight into my own presentation. So her presentation is a pre-recorded session, so uh, she's not actually with us online. But uh, it, it's <laughs> thank you so much for paying attention because otherwise if she was still talking, that would have been a little bit awkward for all of us. So um, in the meantime, I'll um, share my own screen um, again and start my own presentation. We did it in order of the year of publication. So we started with Dr. Arten uh, uh, Junge first, Corinne Kath, who just published um, earlier uh, this year. And uh, I am pleased that um, I am going to launch my publication today. So, fortunately, I don't need sound for mine. Um, no, that's not my presentation slides either. I think I'm confused now. So while I figure this out, could I kindly ask, um, <laughs> I'm sorry to have to put you on the spot like this, uh, but Mr. Carter, please, uh, could you share your vision um, for uh, multi-stakeholderism while we sort out technical issues? Uh, I can, yes. Thanks, Thank Nadia, and good morning, everyone who's in the room, and good evening or uh, good night, wherever the rest of you might be online. Um, I was hoping to be riffing a little bit more off the content that had come through in the other presentations, so uh, I'll actually be quite brief um, at this point. Um, uh, ADA is the Australian Domain Administration. We operate the .au CCTLD for Australia. Um, and the reason that we put together a roadmap on internet governance was simply to try and provoke some discussion and dialogue among the internet community about the ways that internet governance might need to be improved um, to make it more functional for the deeply complicated digital governance environment we all face in the 2020s and beyond. Um, because of the nature of this launch event, I just wanted to focus in on a couple of aspects of legitimacy um, and to do that, uh, relating to some of the things that we said in the roadmap, it's not a promo thing, but you can find the roadmap and read it on our website, if you like, auda.org.au. Uh, so I think there are three. We talked a bit about the importance of deepening and broadening participation in internet governance. Um, based on the sort of practitioner view, and you know, I'm not an academic, this isn't an academic pitch, this is a practitioner and participant perspective that we're offering, that more broadly based participation um, is going to enhance the outcomes and outputs that come from internet governance processes for the same reason that we say that they work at all. Uh, if you get the right mix of stakeholders and perspectives around the table, the idea is that the solutions that get developed by that process 
will be more likely to work and will be more likely to be accepted by the participants and by other people who can rely on the right expertise as having been present. So that goes to one of the discussion questions. Our view is inclusive participation does enhance um, the legitimacy of these initiatives. Um, and one of the, I it's a bit of a truism in some of the institutions that have been talked about already, that most of the protagonists are from particular regions of the world and that there are deficits of participation if you want to take a deficit model um, from Global South participants, from people who are not from Europe or North America in particular. Um, and one of the things that, that I think is material to that is providing effective um, funding uh, approaches so that people without the economic resources to be able to participate have opportunities to do so in a meaningful way. And another, which I think will come up in one of the other presentations, is, is about the culture of these uh, affairs. I, it's been 10 plus years since I attended my first ICANN meeting in this ex as an example. And some people were very friendly and welcoming, and some people were very off-putting and arrogant. And I'm sure it's the same experience today. Um, and I come with a set of attributes and cultural capital that means I will have had an easier journey into some of that than, than other people do. Um, the second thing I want to talk about in terms of legitimacy is the procedural legitimacy that can come from agreed decision-making frameworks, if you like, the constitution of internet governance. One of the things we articulated in our paper was the notion that there should be uh, a review of the foundations of internet governance, how it is practiced in the 2020s and beyond. We leaned a bit on the roadmap that was developed um, in the NetMundial process in 2014 as an example of that kind of framework. But there are other normative uh, and procedural frameworks that are out there about how IG should work. And our view is, again, that if you assemble the breadth of stakeholders and the diversity of stakeholders that are required, the legitimacy of those underpinning frameworks will be enhanced. And the third one I'll just briefly mention is the institutional innovation question. Um, there are some policy questions these days that have emerged in the technology milieu um, that are on the agenda at internet governance uh, events like this. You know, you all have noticed by now the focus on AI at this year's IGF. It isn't immediately obvious that the right assemblage of stakeholders to deal with internet governance questions is automatically going to be the right assemblage of stakeholders to deal with other policy questions. So it might be the case that new processes and institutions are needed to deal with new policy questions that become quite remote from the internet, which is an essential service for many of these technology stacks, but that might engage very much different stakeholder groups. And if we keep trying to shoehorn all of the issues that relate to the internet and issues that don't relate to the internet but that make use of the internet into a single framework, then the internet governance system isn't the internet governance system anymore. It's just the governance system. It's just, it's just running the world. And so we do need to think about the boundaries of the material that we're dealing with and the necessary stakeholders that we need to engage within those boundaries to build the legitimacy of the work that is done within them. So I hope that's progressed a few thoughts. I see, saw some nods and some head shakes, which is perfect by my point of view. Uh, and I'll pass back to you, Nadia. Thanks. Thank you so much for your comments. So hopefully I have figured it out quite right now. And we will be able to see Dr. Kareen Kath joining us um, on the screen. And governance based title of this panel suggests, and given I'm not there in person, I will be uh, giving some guidance on the slides as we go. So next slide, please. Um, so in this brief talk, I will try and do three specific things. Provide a bit of an introduction to the PhD research that I've done specifically looking at internet governance cultures and their rougher edges. 
summarize some of my key findings as I have published them in a recent report called Loud Men Talking Loudly on the Exclusionary Cultures of Internet Governance, uh, which was a report that I published for the launch of the Critical Infrastructure Lab at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, the report is on their website and also go check out their work if you haven't heard of them yet. They're really wonderful. Um, and then I'll hand over to the next speaker or Q&A or whatever Nadia thinks is best. Uh, next slide, please. So by way of introduction, my name is Corinne Kath. I'm an anthropologist of Internet Governance. Uh, I wrote an ethnography of the Internet Engineering Task Force uh, and finished my PhD in Oxford in 2021. I currently work at the University of Delft, where I'm doing postdoctoral research on the politics of cloud computing, but this particular topic remains uh, near and dear to me. Next slide, please. Um, so what I'll be doing today is present some of the research that draws from my PhD, um, where I wrote an ethnography about an important internet governance body called the Internet Engineering Task Force. And the Internet Engineering Task Force is one of the oldest internet governance bodies that makes key protocols and standards that enable networks to connect. And I know the importance of the role of the technical community is top of mind uh, for many of you in the room. Uh, and, uh, and I think this research, the research that I've done, sort of speaks to both the, the capacities and the limitations uh, and the importance of including civil society explicitly into the work that the technical community does. And you can also find my PhD research, which is published on my website. Next slide, please. Now, I know that all of you have better things to do than to read a hundred and odd, 180 odd uh, page academic thesis. So let me just summarize some of my findings about the exclusionary and sometimes discriminatory aspects of internet governance organizations for you, as I've out outlined in the report that you can see over there. No, sorry, over there. Next slide, please. Um, in the report, as in uh, some of my other academic work, which is based on multiple years of field work and participant observation within the Internet Engineering Task Force, uh, as well as numerous uh, semi-structured interviews with people who work in these kind of spaces, I really asked the question of how suitable uh, certain internet governance organizations are for civil society participation and what this tells us about internet governance cultures and how those can be both open and exclusionary at the same time. And the reason why I think it is important to look at this is because if all of us didn't to a certain extent believe in the importance of the openness of internet governance or the value of the multi-stakeholder model, um, we wouldn't be here participating in the IGF today. Um, especially for some of us, uh, because for some of us, it's the dead of night. Um, and this is all very true, but I've also found that two things can be true at the same time. The multi-stakeholder model can be important and can be a valuable model for governing the Internet and, and other technologies. Um, and at the same time, the practice by which it is done can be discriminatory to minority voices, especially those of civil society. Um, representing human rights values, the voices of women, and voices of people from the majority uh, world. And if we want to maintain the, the openness of the multi-stakeholder model, we need to, with some urgency, address these ways in which internet governance cultures can be exclusionary and uh, discriminatory. Um, and as I'm, I'm sure you, you know, I'm not the only one uh, stressing the urgency of dealing with the some of the inequities that are inherent to who can afford to be part of internet governance communities, right? Tackling these inequities, I believe, is a better and a preferable route than, as some others have suggested, restarting internet governance in a multilateral fashion. Um, I believe that pursuing a multilateral approach, just because the multi-stakeholder model is one that is less that perfect, it's perhaps throwing out the baby with the bathwater. But at the same time, I also believe we need to go much beyond deepening and broadening participation, as some people advocate for, um, as participants are still going to be, especially um, minority voices, are still going to be incredibly unlikely to stay involved when the cultures in which they are expected to participate are going to be hostile to their needs and to their presence. Uh, next slide. So my report lays out what loud men, 
as an organizational culture in some internet governance organizations costs us when we're striving for an internet that serves a diverse public interest. Next slide, please. And some of the findings that I want to share with you today are, are on this slide. So what we see is that many seemingly open, many seemingly accessible internet governance organizations where key debates about the internet infrastructure or policies happen, uh, where, where web standards are discussed, where the functioning of browsers are discussed, etc., are, even though they seem procedurally open, are culturally closed off can be hostile, can be surprisingly hard to participate in, especially for civil society folks, especially for women, and again, especially for participants from the majority world. And what happens is these exclusionary cultures create this invisible barrier that makes it extra hard for these groups to be able to participate, even though they are bringing a very, very much needed non-commercial public interest perspective to debates about technical functioning of the internet. Um, and while many civil society practitioners in this room might not be surprised you know, by these findings or by these different uh, hurdles and barriers that I outlined in the rest of my research, there is comparatively little, at least academic documentation of this type of hostility in existing um, research literature or even in policymaking co policy maker conversations about the internet governance. And it is another topic that we need to put on the table if we are to maintain the good bits of the multi-stakeholder model. Next slide, please. Um, and we often tend to talk uh, about how open internet governance organizations are. And that's true along some axes. Um, I found, however, that there is a bit of a disconnect between procedural openness, which is a slightly lower bar that many internet governance organizations will meet to some extent at least, and actual accessibility. And this disconnect in part stems from different cultural dynamics. What we see is that internet governance organizations routinely tend to cater to particular groups of people taking their assumptions and their expectations um, as the standard and doing not enough to accommodate and anticipate different perspectives and needs. Now, for example, um, we are all here, um, primarily speaking English to each other, right? So English is often the working language in a lot of these organizations with an American orientation towards the market as the primary form of governance also being very endemic. Um, meetings occur at different sites across the globe. Again, the IGF being but one example of that. And a lot of these locations are incredibly hard to access for people from the majority world who um, face all sorts of visa challenges and a heavier financial burden when it comes to traveling. Same for people with caretaking responsibilities, um, with employers that cannot foot the bill for long distance travel, for people with disabilities, etc., etc. Uh, it becomes very hard to participate. So the group that is left um, is a group that can participate, but it's a smaller group, often one that is much more homogenous than the internet community that they aim to serve. Um, and it is these subtle and cultural ways in which the day-to-day -day functioning of internet governance can exclude uh, groups that need to be heard. And if we take ourselves serious as a community, then we need to address these rough edges in earnest. Next slide. Um, so the, the open multi-stakeholder model of internet governance in which all different parties joining and using the network contribute to decisions about its functioning is integral to the internet success. Now, this is especially crucial at this moment in time when we see that corporate power over internet infrastructure is growing, uh, government and private surveillance is growing, and the space for civil society to act is shrinking. So for better or for worse, uh, internet governance organizations are still a place where the public can claim a seat at the table. But in order for that seat to actually lead to anything concrete, much more work is needed to ensure that these internet governance bodies live up to their promise of being accessible and open to all. Uh, and the work that I've done uh, provides one entry into showing why that is not always currently the case. And so what I hope is that if you take away one thing from this presentation, uh, let it be this. Internet governance organizations may be procedurally open, but they can be culturally closed off. 
and unwelcoming in practice. And the gap between the rules on paper on the one hand and this reality in practice can be explained in part through the exclusionary effect of its cultures. And it is these cultures that make it difficult for civil society to be able to join the decision making processes they so urgently need to join. And again, understanding how this plays out should curb our impulse to position internet governance organizations also as naturally capable of delivering us an internet that answers to the public. It's unfortunately not that simple. So uh, coming to my final words here, um, designation, designations of internet governance organizations as exemplary in this regard uh, often depend on ignoring or at least disregarding the exclusionary effects of cultural dynamics in favor of surface level procedural access. And we as a community can and must do better. And not just for our own sake, but also to push back arguments made by detractors of the multi-stakeholder model. Uh, and I think that the fact that we're coming here today is a clear sign of the fact that we as a community can and must do better. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to Dr. Karine Kath for sharing her presentation. So it's then my pleasure to share uh, my own presentation um, about youth participation in internet governance. So my research um, for my PhD has been looking at multi-stakeholderism in internet governance and specifically the stakeholder group that I've chosen was youth. We always talk about meaningful youth participation. Our common agenda uh, asked for looking at mechanisms on how to engage our youth in policymaking processes. We have spoken about um, an IGF uh, working strategy on the inclusion of youth. We have the IGF youth track. And so uh, what, one of the things that I set out to do is to understand uh, youth in these spaces. And for this, my research looked at uh, an agent of change, youth meta-participation at the IGF, where I looked at how youth are creating new spaces within the IGF when they see that the processes that they're getting involved with do not reflect or engage in the manner that they find um, uh, approachable or that they have access to. So they use existing mechanisms within the IGF to create new spaces or they create um, uh, additional spaces uh, that align with the values of the IGF. I created a policy brief on youth participation in internet governance with recommendations on how uh, youth can um, be further integrated. And for this year's uh, uh, annual symposium of GIGANET, uh, I presented uh, youth participation on regional and global level, the dynamics of meaningful youth participation. And with this um, latest article, I proposed a definition for what is meaningful participation, which is based <coughs> on <coughs> which is based on the definition from Malcolm. And the definition I w uh, came with was aiming to capture the extent to which the processes in question are effectively designed to incorporate the viewpoints of youth participants into the development of internet governance policies in a balanced way this being the essential feature from which this subset of multi-stakeholder processes can claim democratic legitimacy. Building on that, um, I used uh, a revision of Arnstein's ladder. Arnstein's ladder looks at um, non-participation, tokenism, and citizen power. And when they describe Arnstein's ladder and use case studies, they use each rung and give an example. But what I find with the Internet Governance Forum, that it is an ecosystem. It is more than just uh, this individual component is separate from each other. So I proposed a pyramid of participation. I used elements of the ladder to propose a pyramid in which we see how we integrate within the uh, IGF. So we integrate first. You're sitting here today and I'm speaking with you now, and, and uh, our other speakers shared their thoughts and ideas with you about their research, about uh, the, the work that they've done, their perceptions, their interpretations of what they see and what they've researched. So you're being informed. But we will open up the floor and we'll have reflections from our discussants to, uh, and, and af have asked them to consult, to provide input, to exchange. And this is how we integrate. We become familiar with content and with processes. 
But at some point, you come into this leadership position. You come here as a partnership. Maybe some of you are session organizers and you collaborate with the, the community to create your sessions. Uh, and maybe some of us will work closely with the IGF Secretariat as consultants or uh, a form of a facilitator where you have delegated power to facilitate uh, particular positions. And I mentioned before, when these structures are not achieving the aims and goals that you have, you can go into meta-participation where, where you feel you have some control to create the systems that you want, with, which can be used through processes of the IGF or creating your own processes aside that you align with the IGF. And then, of course, what Arnstein's ladder talks about is tokenized participation. Um, and this is something that when I created the pyramid of participation, um, I believe that it was outside of the scope. I believe that um, when we have purpose, we want it to be meaningful. And um, there is a tokenized, uh, tokenized processes, but tokenized processes were not included in the study. Or uh, So when we felt that there were tokenized um, um, pro uh, activities or things that were interper interpreted as tokenized, it means that meaningful participation has failed us. And then in this research that I've, do, that I've done, I analyze it through the lens of why and how they are not able to meaningfully participate, um, rather than looking at it as this process was made to tokenize you. I, I believe that we want to have meaningful participation and sometimes we fail, and how did we fail that? So here are just a few examples. Um, using the um, permanent participation, um, and interviews uh, with European uh, participants um, at, uh, from, from EuroDIG uh, and YouthDIG, I looked at uh, which activities that they participated in and what they felt was their purpose and how they um, thrived, but also how they felt that the structure or their personal ambitions failed them. So, when they, uh, when they come into the integration part where they're informing and consulting at Eurodig, they were learning about the content. They were learning about how Eurodig works, the processes. They, f they assessed what was the structure accessibility? Are you capable of engaging or not? And uh, they learned that when you uh, are part of the Eurodig community, this can lead to responsibilities and that's form of integration. You then move towards a natural way into the leadership positions. But on the other hand, when we uh, see that meaningful participation has failed is when personal reasons, motherhood, for example, or fatherhood, um, or they uh, found that their career opportunities were not aligned with their ambitions, uh, or they had structural reasons uh, why uh, they were not able to engage. Uh, for example, uh, when there are time zone problems, uh, when there are uh, different opportunities that were uh, not aligned, such as the topics of that year doesn't align with your personal ambitions. And then um, we go through the uh, uh, through this entire system at both Eurodig, but also at the global IGF. So at the global IGF, we looked at the different ways participants attend from YouthDig to Eurodig and to the IGF. And where were they capable of contributing on the informing consulting level, but also where, they, where meaningful participation had failed. Uh, and therefore, I am pleased to share with you, because of my uh, research and the support of the Eurodic Secretariat, I was able to look and reflect on uh, YouthDIC, the Youth Dialogue on Internet Governance, the pre-event uh, for youth uh, to Eurodic, for them to learn about the uh, the context of in which Eurodig will present that year to learn about the processes uh, and how to integrate into the Eurodig community. And based on this, uh, I created a publication which you can find at the Eurodig booth, uh, which talks about the Eurodig philosophy. If you remember the definition of meaningful participation, you remember that we spoke about structure, about how to contribute and how uh, youth are continuously evolving. And this publication reflects on um, how we approached uh, YouthDIG, how can we integrate them, and how can we further their continuous meaningful participation. And we hope that you will reflect on this publication and also come back to us with feedback. 
because it's always the importance that we have with Youth Dick that we always engage our participants to ask them if they come back next year, how would you do it? What would you change to make your participation more meaningful? They give us our feedback and then we invite them to join the Youth Dick Org team to implement what they would like to see, the change that they would like to see. And that is what this publication hopes to do to further con uh, continue this discussion about how can we continue uh, meaningful participation from the regional to the global IGF. So thank you very much. I would there then like to ask um, uh, our discussants for their initial reflections of our three presentations and, um, uh, and, and, and the questions that we had. And in the meantime, if you have any comments or questions, please do come to the, um, the, the microphone. But then I would like to ask um, uh, Ms. Lindenberg if you could start with your comments. Thank you, and thank you for being invited. Well, um, there's a lot of questions you asked us. So what is the r relationship between inclusive participation and the legitimacy of the multi-stakeholder model? I don't think anyone questions that there is a strong link. We discuss it all the time, uh, also in the high-level panels, um, that ensuring inclusive and meaningful participation uh, from the border community is the core, uh, is crucial for the multi-stakeholder model. Um, uh, and at some of the research and surveys, the surveys that you mentioned now uh, shows that there are several important voices, stakeholders that are not aware of the discussions we have in uh, in um, internet governance. And uh, of course, that's uh, that's a huge challenge for the legitimacy of the multi-stakeholder uh, community, and lays the great responsibilities of us who are already participating. In what we should do. Uh, with that problem. So I don't think anything, uh, anyone questions the importance of discussions like this. Um, and uh, what can we do then? Um, well, um, I think that uh, one thing we should look into is also the various uh, forums that we have. Uh, as a small state, I represent the Norwegian government. Uh, we are a bit concerned if we have a lot of arenas that we discuss the same topics that we, um, because it is, um, it is challenging to follow all the different discussions if it is a lot of different forums. And I'm not talking about, you know, the forums that are national or regional because that feeds into this discussion and is very important. But we should uh, also, um, I think, um, concentrate on making the forums we already have stronger. Um, so, uh, so that's one thing. Um, making the most out of the most uh, the existing structure we already have and i also think that we should go deeper into sharing best practices within the igf and the multi-stakeholder community uh, i think uh, the, the report from oda shows that uh, you have a uh, room within the multi-stakeholder system like igf for more focused dialogue between experts and sharing of best practices. I think that's one thing that would make it even more meaningful to participate and will draw broader groups into the IGF and, and the multi-stakeholder discussions. So a uh, good sharing of practices. Maybe we should also start to measuring what we are doing in some way to see how we impact uh, the, the involvement of the internet uh, in these forums because it is discussions that we also need to, to see some meaningful results, you know, for, uh, for others to take from this community and take home and, uh, and uh, to make uh, best practices more shared. I think that's one thing that we can contribute more to. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And then quickly, Ms. Hever, if I could have your reflections. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, so I'll try to keep it really brief because I already saw we're over time. Um, but yeah, coming from the Netherlands, um, working together with a broad array of uh, stakeholders is very com very common. Um, we've been pollering since approximately 1200, and uh, that was to protect ourselves from, from the North Sea. And we've done that with a broad array of stakeholders. So I could maybe say it's in my veins to to, to talk with stakeholders, but it's, it's not something that's al always common for governments to do. And I think that's very special um, about the IGF, that we're talking together on an equal footing um, and um, 
um, that that we have the opportunity for to talk with civil society, with the tech community, with the business community, um, and with government, and um, that it's not government inviting you to to say whatever you think. And well, okay, thank you. We'll see you next year. But I really hope for for meaningful uh, participation. Um, and um, I just wanted to reflect briefly on, on ICANN, as I'm uh, the Dutch GAC uh, representative, so that's uh, for the gov government stakeholder uh, advisory, no, government advisory committee in ICANN, um, and um, particip about participation in ICANN. I still don't see that all governments are, um, uh, are represented in ICANN, um, at the moment, there are 182 members uh, from government and 38 observers. Um, so that's not the 193 um, that the UN counts as, uh, as government. Um, but also, at the last ICANN meeting, there were 73 uh, government members um, um, participating and um, eight observers. Um, I didn't do a quick uh, regional uh, check, but um, it's I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not an equal distribution across the world. And um, despite the fact that it's not equal in, th in the GAC, it's even less equal, I'm pretty sure, in the other stakeholder groups. Um, so um, I personally hope to see with the next round of uh, uh, GTLDs, which uh, so that's uh, generic top level domains, um, I would hope to see that um, this stakeholder group becomes more diverse with um, a broader array of, um, of uh, top level domains in other languages and other scripts um, and uh, ensuring that more registries and registrars are equally distributed across the world and that it doesn't have this immense Western um, um, uh, 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 immense Western grouping um, where they are uh, currently. Um, so yeah, that would be m two of my reflections on, on your questions and hopefully we can have one or two remarks from others, thanks. Thank you very much. I fear that uh, there's not a lot of time left over because uh, the opening ceremony will start soon and I think that everybody would want to uh, join that. But certainly I do not believe that this conversation uh, has to stop here and I'd be, I'd be welcome and also my, uh, co uh, my colleagues are also uh, keen on furthering the discussion. But I would like to thank you all so very much for coming here today in reflection and I apologize for the technical uh, problems uh, that we had today that we could not engage better. But I would also like to thank very much the staff for doing their very best to ensure that this go everything is running smoothly, but also the captioners that are writing things live and those who are interpreting into English and Japanese for their services here today. So thank you all very much, and we hope to uh, continue this conversation. Have a really lovely IGF.